Howard Rourke's essential defining characteristic is his independence. He has his own independent standards for what he wants to achieve in his architecture and for what he wants out of life. And he pursues his values independently for the sake of his own happiness. And so he knows what he wants out of life and he knows um, and he knows that it's only by staying true to his own standards that he's going to achieve what he wants in life. And there's a sense in which he's, he's completely independent of other people. He needs clients in order to you know, be an architect. He needs clients in order to build. But the point is that he knows that he can achieve his success so long as he can find his kind of people and that they will come to him by designing the buildings, the kinds of buildings that he wants to design, he'll attract the kind of people that he wants and he'll be able to build the buildings that he wants to. Now he goes through an incredible struggle. He has an incredibly difficult struggle and, and you know, part of it is just the fact that he's, he's an innovator. He's, a, he's an original creative thinker. He's doing something completely new and it takes time for people to you know, understand his work and, and to discover him and to seek out what he has to offer. But part of his struggle also comes from the opposition that he faces from the world. You know, the opposition that he faces from the rest of his profession, you know, that, that wants to rest content on doing what everyone else has always done, which is copy the historical styles of the past. And, you know, the opposition from people like Ellsworth Toohey, who are actively out to destroy great creative innovators like Howard Rourke. But through this whole, all of this struggle, Rourke is fundamentally unaffected by any of it. No matter how much pain he experiences, no matter how much whatever obstacles are thrown in his way or the, whatever struggles he has to face, he, he, he's basically unaffected. He has to go work in a granite quarry. Well, it, it's, he's willing to do that He'll, and so that he can save up enough money and come back and keep on trying. And he, it's because he's fundamentally independent of other people that he's fundamentally untouched by anything that other people do. So even an incident as horrible as the Stoddard Temple, where he's basically, he's basically set up by Ellsworth Toohey for, to have this building that he creates, you know, to be sued by the client and, and you know, smeared to the world basically as a fraud. This is all, Ellsworth Toohey contrives this whole scheme in order to destroy Rourke's career. And even in the face of that, and even seeing the Stoddard Temple basically disfigured and ruined, and, and you know, the building um, in effect ruined as a result of this lawsuit, Rourke is fundamentally unaffected by it. And he explains this to Dominique in an important scene. He says, what you're thinking is much worse than the truth. I don't believe it matters to me that they're going to destroy it. Maybe it hurts so much that I don't even know I'm hurt, but I don't think so. If you want to carry it for my sake, don't carry more than I do. I'm not capable of suffering completely. I never have. It only goes down to a certain point and then it stops. As long as there's that untouched point, it's not really pain. You mustn't look like that. Dominique says, where does it stop? He says, where I can think of nothing and feel nothing, except that I designed that temple. I built it. Nothing else can seem very important. So Rourke has a fundamental serenity, and he's fundamentally unaffected by the opposition that he faces from the world. And a big part of the reason for this is that he understands in a way that none of the other characters do what is open to his control and what is not open to his control. He knows that he can't, you know, make decisions for other people. What his clients choose to decide, whether they want to hire him or whether they don't want to hire him, what they want to do with the building after he's built it, he has no control over that. What he has control over is his work. And, you know, he will spare himself no effort. You know, he will, you know, exert himself to the maximum of his ability in order to produce the best that he is capable of. You know, think of him sprawled on the floor of Henry Cameron's office with the coffee pot knocked over, you know, after 
how many nights of all nighters in a row, you know, with the finished design on the drafting table perfectly done. You know, he will work himself to the bone in order to offer his best because these are the things that are open to his control. These are the things that he, you know, can do something about. And the things that he can't do things about, the, the decisions of other people, the opposition of other people, you know, what other people choose to do, it's not something that's subject to his control. And because he knows that, he's fundamentally untouched by it. And you know, he's capable of just going after his goals, pursuing his work his way, waiting for his kind of people to come along and just persisting and staying true to his principles, staying true to his artistic integrity in order to attract the kind of people who want his kinds of buildings so that he can do his work. And in a certain respect, Rourke's attitude towards other people is very simple and very straightforward. It's not, it's full of complexities and machinations and schemes. He's a very simple, straightforward man. He knows what he wants out of life, and he's, what he wants from other people is to trade his best effort for what they have to offer him. And, you know, that's really all it comes down to. Now, after the Stoddard Temple, you know, Tui's scheme basically works to a certain extent. Uh, the commissions dry up. He doesn't get a lot of work, but he gets enough work to keep going. In part three of the book, which is the part that comes after the Stoddard Temple uh, trial, Rourke, in a certain way, it's almost like he's exiled from the book. The, he only appears in one chapter in part three. Uh, and for the, the whole rest of part three, he doesn't make an appearance. So it's almost like he's in exile after the Stoddard Temple. The only time we see him is when Dominique goes to visit him in Clayton, Ohio. And this is when she's on her way to Reno. She's going to divorce Peter Keating and marry Gail Winand. And she goes to see Rourke in Clayton, Ohio. And he's in Clayton, Ohio because he's building a five-story department store in the Midwest. Now, for Dominique, she regards this as a, as a total come down. This is a blow. And it, and it kills her to see Rourke doing a five-story department store you know, when he has so many more important and grand buildings that he's capable of producing. And she says to him, you know, after the Enright House, after the Cord Building. But Rourke isn't bothered by that. What he wants to do is build buildings. And for him, you know, he says, I don't see it that way. She says, well, how do you see it? He says, each building, each building is single. Each building is unique, like a person. And every architectural assignment is an opportunity for him to design a building and to design a Howard Rourke building. And Dominique asks him, you know, what are you waiting for? And Rourke's answer is very profound. He says to her, I'm not waiting. So the point is, he's not waiting. He's not waiting for anything. To, to him, it doesn't matter whether he's building a five-story department store in the Midwest or the tallest skyscraper in Manhattan. So long as he has the opportunity to do his work his way, and as long as, you know, as long as he can do that, he's living his life. He is doing what he wants to do in life, and he's achieving his